Hearst Ranch is a proud sponsor of the Heritage Radio Network. Learn more about Hearst Ranch at HearstRanch.com. You're listening to Feast Meets West, the show tracing the stories behind your favorite Asian foods. I'm your host, Linda Liu. We are broadcasting live from Heritage Radio Network at Roberta's Pizza in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Every episode, we dig deep on an aspect of Asian cuisine or culture by having a conversation with the passionate people from the world of Asian food. Today, we're talking to a couple badass Asian female founders, Sarah Wynn of Wynn Coffee Supply and Ramu Xue of Us 2 Tea. Welcome, ladies. Hi, thanks Hi. for having us. Thanks for having us. Okay, not only have they built their own brands and run their own businesses, they've also personally sourced their products from farms in Asia and are growing their respective movements to change the perception of Vietnamese coffee and Chinese tea drinking culture here in the States. Okay, here's a little bit more about our guests and their companies before we kick things off. Sarah's company, Win Coffee Supply, is the first specialty Vietnamese coffee importer and roaster in the United States. They are ethically sourcing organic Arabica and Robusta coffee beans from Vietnam while creating sustainable relationships with Vietnamese farmers. Sarah is a first-gen Vietnamese-American, and before she got into the coffee business, she's already had and continues to have a multifaceted creative career that includes being the award-winning documentary filmmaker behind NBC News Deported, co-founder of New York Times-reviewed restaurant Lucy's Vietnamese Kitchen, co-founder of podcasting agency Listening Party, and a 2018 Google Next Gen Tech Policy Leader. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Just, you grabbed all the highlights. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> um, and Ramu's company, Us2T, is a smart new tea brand focused on making rare Taiwanese tea more accessible to consumers in the U.S. Often described as the champagne of tea, Taiwanese tea is carefully cultivated using centuries-old traditions crafted by hand and is known for its authentic singular taste. Ranmu is a Shanghai native. Prior to starting Us to Tea, Ramu spent seven years as the lead designer at Mural, a digital canvas that allows people to hang thousands of paintings on their wall. Ramu's design and rebranding work was a major factor in the company's success and acquisition by Netgear. Congrats, Ramu. Thank Yay. you. Okay, so for both of you, this just sounds completely different from what you guys were doing in your past lives. So in your own words, what made you get into the coffee and tea business? Okay, so I think I will probably gonna get start first so um as a chinese you know like moving to the u.s and it's kind of like part part of my tradition to just like been drinking tea my whole life and i realized that you know it's really hard to find like authentic asian tea here and except for the ones in chinatown or you know like those small shops and it's really hard for me to like you know just go somewhere and grab the tea and then just can make it at home and I start thinking like, you know, why now I can just like, you know, create this tea brand and then bring the Asian tea here to share with my friends in the U.S. And, the, you know, because I keep getting asked by a lot of people and they keep constantly saying like, oh, where can I get like really good Chinese tea? And I was like, maybe in China. Um, <laughs> so I was like, you know, that's a great idea. So that's how I got like started. And the timing was perfect. So um, last year we got acquired by Netgear. So <gasps> thank you. Yeah, that was like a, like I can catch a break now. <laughs> yeah, and it was just like kind of like a you know a you know a boost for me in, internally. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay, I can do this. Yeah, because you, know? you did all the branding yeah, work, so yeah, you're exactly. like, oh, I can apply this to my new company. Yeah, so I was like, you know, my job was done there, so I'm gonna go out and then create my own brand. Mm -hmm. So yeah. 
Amazing. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, I get that a lot when folks are like, oh, um, you're doing coffee. And I'm like, how did you get into coffee? It's so different from everything you've done in the past. And I guess in a sense it is. It's definitely kind of, it's a new, whole new industry that I've never been in, involved in, the importing and the roasting and the coffee. Um, but I guess for me, it just feels like such a natural extension of, of my work, which has always been rooted in storytelling and cultural um, you know, representation and community empowerment. And I really just saw coffee as as another platform for me to achieve all these things, whether it's bringing more visibility to Vietnamese producers or bringing more visibility to unsustainable, um, you know, corporate um, patterns or exposing, you know, exploitation within the old corporate coffee industry. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt in a lot of ways, it felt like a very natural transition for me. And then, of course, there was a huge learning curve because I've never worked in the coffee industry. <laughs> so that part was new. But a lot of, um, I think, um, common threads. And very similar to Ramu's experience, you know, I noticed in New York City and around the country that Vietnamese food and culture was really buzzing. And on a similar wavelength, but slightly lower, Vietnamese coffee as a beverage was also becoming very trendy. Mm -hmm. However, the more I looked into it, I noticed that it was actually very hard to find fresh roasted Vietnamese coffee beans in the United States. Right? Wow, why is yeah. that? I don't, that's a great question. That's that's actually a question that I'm constantly pursuing. Like, why is that? You know, in the coffee culture in New York, we see like fresh roasted specialty is really popular with, you know, Ethiopian coffee beans or Colombian coffee mm. beans. It's all about the freshest roast. But we couldn't find fresh roasted Vietnamese coffee beans. And the coffee companies that people were using to make a Vietnamese coffee beverage on their menu was most likely one of two brands. One is a Cafe Du Monde, um, which we don't even know where those coffee beans are from. There's absolutely no transparency <laughs> on their packaging or website about which countries those beans come from. Um, and then the other brand, which um, became more popular over recent years, is a Vietnamese company called Trung Nguyen which is a Vietnamese brand. Um, however, they're very transparent about the fact that they use artificial ingredients and artificial flavorings in their coffee. And both of those brands actually are pre-ground coffee, so they're not necessarily the freshest right. coffee, right? So all of this, just like Ramu, I was like, oh, where can we get Vietnamese coffee in Vietnam? Okay, let's, that's, that's right. a good idea. Let's bring it over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What would you say, like, your mission, ultimate mission would be? So I think for tea, it's like very different than coffee culture here, especially in the U.S., because everyone drinks coffee mm -hmm. and it's a huge hit. But for tea, not a lot of people kind of like know about like Asian tea. So for our mission for us, too, is really to make tea more accessible mm -hmm. for everyone. And we want to speak to people in a way that help coffee speaks to and connect with people here so we're like really you know trying to hit the ground and targeting millennials and to create this like you know brand that everyone can be involved like a community so um, that's really what we want we're like trying to do yeah to just you know like whenever you think about like tea brand that's the first thing you come up with is like us to tea and that's like really our ultimate yeah, goal yeah that's a big mission yeah uh, I have so many goals with Neon Coffee Supply. I think my ultimate goal is to help elevate, you know, um, communities in Vietnam and around the world through the conversation of coffee and through creating systems around coffee production. Um, What's wrong with it right now? Well... One, there's a huge lack of transparency. So Vietnam is the number two producer of coffee in the world. And the number one Yeah, that's one like producer. a buried fact. Exactly. It's okay, buried, well, right? It's, and it's like, why don't we know that, right? Yeah. Why don't more people know that? Um, Vietnam is also the number one producer of robusta beans in the world. And, you know, as of last year, the United States became the number one importer of coffee beans from Vietnam, right? But then in a national survey, consumers were asked, which countries do you associate with coffee production? People named Colombia and Brazil as top two. Mm -hmm. And then Vietnam was the last country they named at just 16% of surveys, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, there's a huge disconnect between what's actually happening in the production and also how consumers understand. And I think what's happening is a lot of um, the coffee that's being being imported is controlled by corporations, and then they filter the beans through, um, you know, other products that we that essentially render the the identity of the beans invisible. And when this happens, producers in Vietnam are kind of stuck in a cycle of poverty because they can't leverage or, you know. Um, 
advocate for themselves for a higher pay because corporations are only producing very cheap products. So they're only going to be willing to pay a very low price tag for the beans, right? Yeah. Yeah. Way to, I don't know, keep that like Asian community down. That's like yeah. really upsetting. I know, right? Yeah. Exactly. And then there's also like, I kind of, as you were, you were talking about that, I also think about like the made in Asia or the made in China yeah. perception exactly. and, and kind of how like, um, you know, the quality of of also like Chinese tea is yeah. I don't know not really in that like elevated space here in yeah. the US definitely it's just very very underrated mm-hmm. especially like if you know is China is booming right now and you know we've been through a lot of phases in the past and usually people just have this image with like you know product that is made in China is like you know bad quality mm-hmm. you know um, but I feel like it's not the truth anymore and actually I found is you know made in China too but we didn't get any credit mm-hmm. and there's so many quality goods and brand like you know um, right now it's just like a huge you know trade war between like <laughs> yeah. America and China you know um, but like I feel like our for our generation is really our mission to change that yes. image yeah really like the Asian brand are really underrated mm-hmm. and really like you know we want to tell the folks you know just the world out there and even for our next generation like you mm-hmm. know you can create like a quality brand yes so that's like very like important. Ramu, I'm so glad you brought up the first generation because that's something that I like to talk about too Mm -hmm. as like as being first generation and myself as being a first generation. I really do believe that we are in such a unique position to change Mm -hmm. um, the course of the world because we are someone um, who is, we have such close ties to our culture and our Mm -hmm. family since our parents are immigrants Mm -hmm. but we also have the know-how and the wits and experience of like a modern and global society and context. So it's like we, we, we have both the awareness and and the the skills and the resources Mm -hmm. to change the things that have just been for so long for so many decades just been um, you know unfair or exploitative so yeah it's such an exciting time I think for all first generations I know and for our for our generation it's actually really lucky because like you know the Vietnamese food is booming and Mm -hmm. a lot of like you know, hip restaurants like you know, like Chinese restaurants are yeah. like up and coming yeah. in New York City, and it just stirs you know the acupuncture mm-hmm. is like a trend right now. Yeah. Like right. right. Yeah. So like, there's so much we can do right. you know there. So to just you know tell the world that like you know this is our culture. Yes. And we're kind of like the medium, kind yeah. of like in between the Western culture and yeah. the Eastern culture. So, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's a lot of responsibility, but like you said, perfect timing. Mm-hmm. Um. Could you guys describe some of your um, varietals and products and and the tasting notes that go along with them? Also kind of like how it's different from what you could find here in the mainstream right now. Yeah, I'll start. So currently um, we import two different types of beans. from They're both from the same farm, so they're single origin farm. We import a specialty Arabica and a fine Robusta. Uh, and those are just two different types of coffee beans. Arabica beans have 60% more sugar and 60% more fats than Robusta beans. That's why they tend to have more of a fruity and sweeter edge to it. And then Robusta beans, um, you know, less sugar, less fat. So it has more of that nutty, bold profile. And it also has nearly two times the caffeine content of Arabica. So it's going to give you like a nice little jolt, right? So in the mainstream coffee culture in the U.S., what we've seen is like this high praise of 100% Arabica across the board. Everyone thinks 100% Arabica is the superior um, and prime way to experience coffee, which is part of the reason goes back to your question, Linda, earlier of like why Vietnam has ha- kind of had a bad reputation because they dominate in robusta beans, right? But truly, they're just two different types of beans, right? And so we import both. I currently have two offerings. One is a 100% Arabica just to kind of like integrate and connect with um, current mainstream consumers in a way mm-hmm. that they're familiar with. Um, and also showing them there's more to Vietnam than just like, um, you know, um, you know, ho- like robusta beans or even like instant coffee. So that 100% Arabica is a, called, um, the 100% Arabica is called Courage. And then the other blend we offer is our signature blend. It's called Loyalty and it's a 50-50 Arabica Robusta. And that's kind of my way of introducing robusta beans into the mainstream. And so what we're going to find in um, the Loyalty, which includes robusta beans, is more of a nutty, bold profile, very chocolatey, dark cocoa, a hint of like like maybe pomelo, and definitely just a little bit more of a higher caffeine kick. 
Mm, I love mm-hmm. that. The way you describe it and also <laughs> named it and kind of reminds me of like Kendrick Lamar. There you go. Yeah, that, yeah. that, is, that is our unofficial theme song. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so for um, our tea, we have four different like uh, varieties and there's like black tea, which we name it called Manhattan Black because it's the most caffeinated tea of mm-hmm. all. So it's handed to the New Yorkers, you know, you're always on the go. And um, for people who don't drink coffee, they may use black tea as like a substance. Mm-hmm. And then we have the Oolong, which is called the homesick. And um, it's just like this like very calming and soothing, like floral taste. Mm. And it's growing on like a uh, 2,000 feet high mountains from Taiwan. And this actually, you know, um, Taiwanese tea is famous for like the oolong tea. Mm-hmm. And another t- national like Taiwanese tea is called baozhong, which is, um, we name it family tradition. Mm-hmm. So usually like when I was in Taiwan, you know, the grandpa will like brew the tea after dinner. So everyone just get together. It's kind of like a family tradition. And is that one is more like a um, melon like fragrance mm-hmm. and also very soothing. It's just perfect after like dinner time. Mm-hmm. If you have like something heavy to just like, you know, Uh, flush it down a little bit (laughs) and then the last one is jasmine tea which is like everyone's you know favorite because it's like green tea scented with jasmine flower and it's just it's called pillow talk so um (laughs) it's just like perfect for you know before bed and just calming your nerves and even like in the morning you know just like it's a lot of girls favorite yeah Mm -hmm. yeah i see what you did there like really capturing the moments throughout the day and creating an offering (laughs) essentially around like every time and need yeah Yeah. exactly because we want to make tea more accessible it's just like um a lot of like the you know traditional like um tea culture is very like you if you go to chinatown you probably have to go through this whole tea ceremony and it's like an hour long and sometimes um it's it's like a very good tradition but i think like right now we're living in like a really fast pace Mm -hmm. especially in new york you just don't have time and we really use the loose leaf tea quality to make it more Mm user-friendly you know as a graphic designer will say so <laughs> we such really such a tech approach <laughs> yeah so we really like just pack the tea into tea bag so like you know everyone can just you know put it in the hot water and you can enjoy the loose leaf tea quality mm. tea and it's always on the go you can carry with you on the plane to travel to your work like everywhere yeah, yeah so basically yeah. I feel more calm just hearing you describe the teas I felt like I was taking a trip with you throughout the day and having a cup of tea along each way oh my god that would yeah, be a very great advertising Yes. idea coffee that you can, <laughs> you can be my investor <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could invest in my own company <laughs> um, it's pretty amazing you guys have really like captured the brand the like activity and the moments for the millennial New Yorker mm-hmm. drinker mm-hmm. that's really cool thank you. thank you and also I think the fact that um, part of your unique story is that you guys have both also directly gone to the source mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that also matters a lot to your mission and story and I think consumers these days they want to understand that yeah. so yeah. I mean how did you guys make that decision to go all the way to Asia to to meet the farmers and how did you decide on who who was going to be your farming partner um so I'll or probably I'll go um first so I um was originally gonna import from China. So I um, did some research. It's just like um, the Chinese tea, there's a, a lot of like exporting problem because we have to go through the whole FDA, um, you know, like um, registration and the test, the testing labs and stuff. So, and I was just wondering like, where can I find the best quality tea? Because I want to build this as like a lifestyle brand, but also provide like quality product. So um, I went to Taiwan for a branding research mm-hmm. and I tried their tea there. And I was like amazed by the taste from like the black tea. And I was just like, you know, why not just, um, you know, import from Taiwan instead. So I just rented a car and then I literally drove to, you know, the tea farms and I just literally doing tea tasting every day with like different farmers. And eventually I found those two family um, tea farmers and it's like they're the third generation um, from like, you know, like 
their you know grandpa's like generation and they pass it on to the grandson and they're like in our age and they it's like so more, like in their 20s and yeah 30s? like very oh, very young farmers? young, young oh, farmers geez. like early 20s i would say and um they took me to their tea farms and they told me about their like you know brewing method and then i was just like take a look and then just try their tea and i just like fall in love mm-hmm. with their you know like dedication because it's like very very hard work Mm -hmm. and especially for like young generation for them to to be in the mountains like 24 hours seven days a week to just you know growing tea that's like i was just so amazed and so moved by their passion about the tea culture Mm -hmm. so i was like you know i'm trying to create this brand and they are millennials and millennials i'm targeting millennials (laughs) and it's kind of like you know the perfect like opportunity like i want to help them to you know bring the tea to the world um, to share their passion with everyone so that's just kind of like aligned it's just um, Mm -hmm. amazing unexpected yeah great partnership yeah yeah so in 2016 when I had started like thinking about this concept I in the fall of 16 I was on my way to Cambodia to film Deported actually the film that you mentioned in the intro and I went to visit my family in Vietnam prior and I go back to Vietnam often most of my extended family still lives there um, my dad's side is from Hanoi my mom's side is from Wang Ai where they now live in Nha Trang so I go back pretty often and when I was on my way there I just hit up my family I was like hey guys I'm gonna come through I was wondering like I had this idea to import um, Vietnamese coffee um, do you know anybody with a coffee farm and one of my aunt said that she actually knew someone who used to be her co-worker who left the company to take over his family farm um, in the lot yes I was like oh and it was honestly so casual the way it happened like it was like she was like yeah I was like oh can we go visit him she's like yeah he's in the lot we got to get a plane down there I was like okay so me and my aunt and my uncle took a plane down to the lot to meet him and Similar to your story, Ramu, I just, mm-hmm. I just, he was so passionate about coffee. It's been in his family for so long, and he was specifically passionate about clean coffee and organic coffee and sustainability and health, you know, which, you know, Vietnam does have, um, you know, a history and a bit of a reputation of, ha- of producing poor quality coffee, um, you know, with, for a lot of different reasons. Um, and also maybe the regulations in Vietnam is are, are different, so you can find coffee in the street that has certain fillers, right? Mm-hmm. So, he, so there is this growing trend and movement of more conscious consumption and sustainability for both the consumers and for the land he was so passionate about organic coffee and um, he showed me his farm he showed me roasting facility showed me his cafe and similar to you I just Mm -hmm. really fell in love with his passion and it really felt like such like a match made in heaven you know and I didn't tour a bunch of coffee farms um, I, I didn't tour the coffee farms till a few years later but just from that first meeting I felt like we were both very aligned in our values and um, so we I started working on the business and it was actually his first time exporting um, green coffee beans and so it was really exciting for him it was really exciting for me my first time importing and so it was a really cool a partnership and a huge learning curve for the both of us because we were learning about how to do all this for the first time together. That's amazing. Yeah. The stars really aligned on that one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. We're going to take a really quick break and we'll be right back with more Feast Meets West. Hearst Ranch is a proud sponsor of the Heritage Radio Network. The Hearst family has been raising cattle on the rich, sustainable native grasslands of California's Central Coast for over 150 years. Piedra Blanca Rancho in San Simeon is the original Hearst Ranch, founded by George Hearst in 1865. George's son was the famous publisher, William Randolph Hearst. In addition to being known for building the iconic Hearst Castle, William was, like his father before him, an avid rancher. In his words, I would rather spend a month at the ranch than any place in the world. Thanks to one of the largest land conservation easements in California history, a joint effort with the California Rangeland Trust, the American Land Conservancy, and the state of California, the working landscape at Hearst Ranch will be preserved forever. Learn more about Hearst Ranch at hearstranch.com.
Welcome back. You're listening to Feast Meets West. So we just talked through the story about how you ladies found your farmers. So what comes next after that? How do you build out your supply chain and go through figuring out what manufacturing looks like? Also doing that for the first time. Yeah, I I get to ask this question a lot because it's, it's, yeah, it's so brand new. And for me, it, it really was just like connecting the dots. And I've never gone through this process. I didn't have anybody map it out for me. So I would just start with what I knew. And so, you know, I found the farm. And then after that, I was like, how do I import? I did a lot of Googling. It's like, you need a customs <laughs> broker. You need a freight forwarder. Okay, freight forwarders. Hey, can I get some quotes? It's just kind of like following the trail. And then every time I make contact, so then, you know, I reached out to a bunch of freight forwarders. I get quotes. And then, you know, I, I found a customs broker. Then I, when I would meet somebody in, you know, in um, within the supply chain, I'd ask them, "Hey, um, this is what I'm trying to do. What do I need to do from to get to from point A to point B? Like, what do you need from me? Who should I talk to? What is the timeline?" And I just kept asking those questions to everyone I met along the way, and eventually I pieced it all together. Yeah, just like really smart business building skills yeah. and very logical. And just asking questions. Yeah. Yeah, I would definitely say that. Um, this whole process was the most frustrating part mm -hmm. because uh, for for me, like our manufacturing is like, I mean, the packaging producer are in Shanghai and we have to ship our package package to Taiwan where the tea, are, tea farmers are and they're going to package the tea there and then we have to import from Taiwan and our fulfillment center is in LA. So it's just like what you said, I've never done this process before and it's just the frustration, you know, coming from like the importing and exporting and, you know, like, like figuring out the rules. Yeah, exactly. And also, you know, like, um, cause I don't know how you, um, get your coffee here, but we ship the teas by sea. So mm -hmm. there's like a certain amount of like, you know, date. And then there was like one, um, really frustrating time was like, we almost didn't make it to the ship mm -hmm. and oh I would, yeah so we paid everything and um, the packaging from Shanghai was delayed and got caught in the custom in Taiwan so um, it was just like a lot of like endless night I was just like you know I went to the um, packaging factory in Taiwan and I talked to the guy who's in charge I was like please like you know this is like my first time like and then he was like so nice and I told him like my mission I want to bring like you know the tea culture here and he's like okay I'll help you so he I kind of feel bad but he like made everyone like work on the weekend so we just can make it to that line and wow. to ship the tea out on time so it was just like a lot of puzzles that we have mm -hmm. to put together and I really had no idea what I was doing so yeah. really it's just like lost asking a lot of questions like you said and um yeah, just like helping people like this person will connect you with another one. And it's just like a role of like, you know, um, yeah, great helps from yeah, everyone. Yeah, for sure. It yeah. sounds like you guys met some amazing people along yeah, the way definitely, that definitely, were, yeah. they were willing to like yeah. help educate mm -hmm. and yeah. support the mission, which is really great. Um, so where can we find your product now and, and what's your distribution plan? Um, so right now we're only uh, we are focusing on e-commerce. So you can like find our teas on like s2t.com, and we recently just partnered with like uh, Stephen Allen. Um, we will be selling the tea at his store, and he's also like online website. And for New Yorkers, you can go check out his um, store in Tribeca. And we also partnered with uh, Sip Spy, which is like a the biggest like tea subscription service in um, in the U.S. and for the tea lovers, you can also get us our tea from there. And um, also, just like a shout out, we're gonna be at the Render Craft um, um, Fair next next weekend. So in Brooklyn Expo, so you can also come say hi and try some tea. Nice. And in the future, we'll be our plan is trying to open our own tea shops by the end of the year in New York City and get into like boutique hotels and like hip market in yeah. Brooklyn. So just a lot of like branches. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's really ambitious. And like you said, a lot of different channels. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. 
Uh, currently, folks can definitely find us on the interwebs. We also have an e-commerce platform, and we ship all over the country in Canada. Um, you know, my I'm focusing a lot on the B2B wholesale. So in New York City, you can also find NCS at Pho Bar and Mott Street, at mm. Saigon Dape and Murray Hill, at Madame Vaughan East Village. And also, in April, I launched a cafe called Cafe Fiend inside of On Choi in the Lower East Side at 85 Orchard Street. And we are open five days a week, Tuesdays through Saturdays. We have a full coffee program and, you know, some really fun specialty iced coffee drinks. We brew both of the NCS blends through Big Fiend, Small Fiend, um, a pour over V60 and also an auto drip. And we're working on a few new locations um, around the country for retailers and definitely I'd love to have um, my own brick and mortar um, cafe in the near future yeah Mm -hmm. you guys are coming at it from yeah such a millennial angle it's like (laughs) you know e-commerce collabs events first and then brick and mortar like eventually we're getting to it of course but you know that's not what the older generation would have done it's funny how you identify that as a millennial angle I just I just saw it as like a lack of resources angle (laughs) You know, <laughs> like instead of going all in first on like a brick and mortar, we get to do these smaller things to kind of like that more grassroots and more accessible. But yeah, I'm glad that works too, millennial. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think it's also interesting that we are kind of like our own customers. Yeah, that's so, true, for sure. Yeah, so I, call, I keep thinking like, where would I go, you know, to um, go off to brunch or like try teas or, you know, where do I shop? Like, you know, so those are the places that I'm kind of like mapping out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is true. We are also our customers. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So how big are your teams right now? Um, Is this something that you guys are doing like full time? Mm hmm. I mean, I just launched NCS, New York Coffee Supply, in November 2018. I launched Cafe Fiend in April. So it's I'm pretty much full-time. Um, I might be 10 15% elsewhere, um, working on some film media projects, which is still a huge passion of mine that's never going to go away when those opportunities come. My team at Cafe Fiend is currently six employees, and then at NCS, it's one employee. Um, and then some like part-time help here and there, maybe some volunteers here and there, friends and family here and there. Yeah. But it's mostly largely, I mean, I launched it by myself and it's been mostly by myself. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so for us, um, I'm the solo founder, but um, I hired a bunch of like copywriter, uh, copywriter freelance, freelancer and like interns. And full time, we have a CMO working with me for like in charge of marketing. And uh, in the near future, I'm going to spend the team like, you know, hiring sales and like, you know, um, accountant, social media manager. So that's like in the next couple of months will happen. Yeah. yeah, and you're doing all the branding, I assume. Yeah, yeah, because I'm <laughs> okay. a graphic designer, yeah. so to just because um, we have limited budgeting, so yeah, right. but, yeah, we have to do everything. You're yeah. wearing multiple hats yeah. when you're like the sole founder. I will say, yeah, as a sole founder and bootstrapping startup, it's yeah. super helpful to have design skills. <laughs> So you could create all of the assets yeah. and all the packaging because it really adds up if you yeah, yeah if you don't have those skills. Um. What's the reception been like so far? Are you um, like surprised at the response from your customers? Um, to be honest, yes, because I've uh, been giving out samples and just like been to events, and I'm just like so surprised because I have people calling me after they try the samples, like strangers, mm-hmm. and they're being like oh my god this tea is amazing because they're like from Taiwan and they're like oh it just reminds me of home you know this is what exactly what it tastes like when I was back home and those comments are just like I was like oh my god so I get the validation from Mm -hmm. people from Taiwan so that's like a huge plus Mm -hmm. and it's just like all the buyers who's like been testing you know tasting the tea at the event they just like love the you know the fragrance and the note and yeah, you know the quality is there yeah so I'm just like very thrilled and I keep telling my tea farmers I was like your tea is selling so they're like this is also their first time importing to the US yeah. or you know and so they're like so excited yeah, yeah. um I I've been very surprised at the amount of positive support and feedback we've gotten, honestly, I, 
I, I guess a part of me was skeptical or nervous or even I underestimated like the market a little bit. I had a feeling there'd be some reception because of just the trend in Vietnamese food mm. and culture. But, you know, in, within the coffee community, there was such a resistance to Vietnamese coffee. Um, Vietnam has had such a negative reputation about its coffee for so long. I was really nervous about entering the market with my mission, but the feedback has been so positive and I think on a more like emotional level like the coffee side people love the profile of the coffee because I think over the last few years the trend in coffee has been very high acidic fruity and kind of like sour taste in coffee um, and that's not my personal preference and our current two blends are more of like the medium dark roast low acidic coffee um, And so even like coffee enthusiasts aside the feedback there has been positive but on a more personal level you know I've gone so much touching feedback from Asian Americans and Vietnamese Americans who feel so seen, right? Yeah. They, they literally say, I feel seen. Like, oh my God, I, I, I've never seen my last name like plastered. I've never felt so proud to see my last name. Like, I never thought my last name could be like presented in this way, you know, like, and, you know, and that's just like the marketing and the branding, the packaging, you know, alone and the impact that that's able to make on people in such a deep way is something that I feel really um, proud of because I never had that growing up. So it's been really, really touching and really exciting. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to how much more we can do as we grow. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, sometimes it takes an immigrant, a first gen to do this. Mm hmm. Um, so it's very bold. That's so cool. Um, what other upcoming projects or collabs do you guys have? So I know you talked about maybe some upcoming like physical um, spaces that you'll be in. What else can you share? I mean, I'm, I pretty much shared everything that's coming up. Definitely working on our own brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. um, definitely trying to grow our sales to kind of kind of cover all of the state all the states um and collaborations are definitely on the horizon i love um the idea of collaborating whether that's co-labeling or collaborating on retail coffee experiences um yeah lots of things to look out for cool um i'm in talk with this uh local hip um supermarket and the founder is uh, based in brooklyn so um we're still like in talk with the deals and stuff but hopefully that will uh come through and um i'm also talking with like um folks in arlo hotel mm -hmm. so probably eventually we're probably gonna do like event tasting event there so to just get the word out yeah. and it would be like really because they're one of my favorite boutique hotel i see you're really marketing to yourself here <laughs> Well, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> it I makes was, things like hard and easy because you you have to be like honest with mm -hmm, yourself mm -hmm. and you have really high expectations. But then yeah. if you make it work, it works. Yeah. yeah. And I just amazed by the you know I just like literally reach out to people and people do reply mm -hmm. and you know I was just so amazed like by the amount of like responses I get. It's just called emailing. But it's like really you need to like state your mission and what yeah. you're trying to do. And I think people really will understand and support you. Yeah, it's kind of like the law of attraction. It's just, you know, you manifest in your mind and you visualize it and it will happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so encouraging. Yeah. yeah. That. Um, what does success look like for you in the next year? Where do you want to be in like 12 months? Success for me in the next 12 months is an increased state of mental health, an increased positive state of mental health. I think that's something that I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm increasingly becoming more aware of as I am trying to scale, I'm trying to grow, I have more responsibilities, I have more people I'm responsible for, I have more accounts the stress levels and anxiety also grow with that is more at stake. Yeah. And as soon as I start fundraising or accepting other people's money, like that's going to add to my stress. So, you know, along the way, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be very aware of my mental health and trying to make sure that I'm, I'm taking time for myself and incorporating healthy habits, incorporating self-care. Um, my mom is a big influence on this mission because she's always like, she's very supportive of me. She's super excited, but she's always like, if you don't have your health, you have nothing. You right. know? If you don't have your health, it doesn't matter how much money you make or it doesn't matter how much money you can make. If you don't have your health, you have nothing. So I'm just trying to brace myself to be in a healthy mental state as I scale. Um, next 12 months, also, I would love to reach more sustainability 
for myself on a personal level, for my company, so that meaning I could keep going, and also for my team, meaning I could keep my team on board and help elevate them, and also sustainability for my producers in Vietnam, and just helping them to, you know, 360 all around the board, creating a more sustainable lifestyle for all of us, from the personal to the social to the environmental. I love that. Yeah, that's really, really, like, moving, because, uh, you know, it's just so hard to be an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. and it's just so lonely mm-hmm. and um, this is like the first time I ever felt lonely since I moved here you you're know? responsible for everything yeah exactly because you're just you don't know what is the right decision mm-hmm. until you test it out mm-hmm. and it's just so scary because you know you can't just ask people because everyone is different so I think for me in the next 12 months um, from a business perspective I really hope the brand can take off in New York and it just means so much to me personally. It's just because I come here uh, with nothing and I didn't have any friends and, you know, I don't have green card. I literally was on OPT's, like, student visa. So I got rejected so many times. Like, I, it took me, like, six months to get my first job. And it's really a slap in the face. And I was like, oh, my God, I... I'm actually very, you know, an experienced and I'm so young and naive, like New York really hate you hard. So um, I really hope like the brand can take off in New York and to just inspire more people like me. Is um, So I follow this Instagram channel called I, Why I Love New York City and just keep seeing people talking about their experiences, you know, coming to New York and how hard it is and how they get through it. I think it's just so inspiring. And, you know, like for a younger self, you know, like I'll be like, oh, okay. So, you know, they've been through that. I can do that too. So um, from a personal level, I really want to try to become like, you know, to create this better working environment for my employee Mm because I think that's like just really important because being the boss, like, Everything you do, everything you say really, really affects your employee. Yeah. And you really need to watch out, like, you know, because you have to tell them, like, you are doing a good job. But at the same time, how can we make this better? How to create, like, a more engaging environment? And also for me, like, personally, um, like you said, like, you know, the mental health is really important. Sometimes I just, like, you know, I have so many, like, breakdown. It's just, like... I have never done this before and you you get rejected all the time and how do you like fight with that and it hurts your ego and it makes me so humble right now and just more vulnerable because um, I feel like so big and small at the same time Mm -hmm. so it's just definitely like a personal growth and I think it really helps me to become a better person so I think for the next 12 months um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens yeah Mm -hmm. wow a lot to accomplish ahead but this is amazing I think you guys are so honest to yourselves and so that's definitely going to encourage a ton of um, business growth but personal growth Mm -hmm. so exciting Um, Okay, before we wrap up the show, we're going to do a round of quick fire questions. And (laughs) this is just like really fun and fast. So just share what comes to mind first. Okay. All right. So how many cups of coffee and tea are you drinking a day? Two. Uh, Three. Three. Yeah. Okay. Um, What are your go-to drink combos or varietals that you have? Uh, Loyalty as a latte or as a cafe sua? Which is um, c- um, coffee with condensed milk in the fiend drip. Mm. Oh, I just drink pure loose leaf tea. So it's like the black tea in the morning and then jasmine tea before I go to bed and oolong in the afternoon. Nice. Yeah. So what's one of your favorite Asian dishes that you like to eat with your drinks? Oh, with my with coffee? Yeah. Is there anything that like you feel like would pair well with your, say, your coffee beverages? Uh, personally, I don't usually eat anything when I'm um, drinking coffee. So, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're really like focusing on the, the coffee experience. Yeah, I usually do like water to hydrate, then a cup of coffee, um, and then I'll eat a meal or a snack separately because I feel like the flavors don't mix well. Mm. Yeah. For me, yeah. Yeah, for me, I usually drink tea after the meal, so to just kind of like get you know my stomach like like you know going and just yeah. like more calming. So yeah. Mm-hmm. 
That's, a, that's an interesting question. I saw the yeah. yeah. I'm like, this is about like Asian food. Yeah. yeah so, um, are there any like go to like coffee or tea shops in the city that you like to frequent? Yes, my number one favorite coffee shop is in Bushwick called Mixtape. Bushwick. Um, it's a staple in the neighborhood. They're actually just a window, and you know, I, I, I. It's my top frequented spot. Great vibe, great people, amazing team. The owner operator is also another Vietnamese American. Shout out to Lynn, who is also you know one of my supports when I was launching the business. So mixtape, um, and also I love Devotion in Williamsburg. I love their direct trade model as well, um, and I'm a fan of La Colombe. Oh yeah, me too. Yeah, um, yeah, so yeah. Good. I love their draft lattes. So, so delicious. Good. Yeah. Uh, for tea, I'm actually a huge fan of bubble tea as well. So boba guy is yeah. definitely yeah. Yes. They're like on the notch. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. They have like really. I think it's also. Um, I think the owner is like a Taiwanese. Um, yeah, person. So I think it's just amazing, and the quality is just so good. Yeah, they've yes. been on the show as well. Oh, well, nice. Yeah, yeah and it, yeah. it was really incredible hearing their story because mm-hmm. um, they're like we're. No, it's not just about bubble tea. It's mm-hmm. a mission. Yeah. We're like building with like thinking around employees first. Yeah. And like they model themselves like against like Patagonia, for mm-hmm. example. And so you don't really expect that from yeah. like a bubble tea brand or like a yeah. beverage brand. But this is like the thinking now. That's yes. awesome. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, okay. What's your favorite Asian restaurant in New York City right now? Uh, for me, no, um, yeah, I have my favorite oh, restaurant. Oh, so do you have like, okay, top three? Yeah, for me, is oh, for Shanghainese food, is definitely China Blue. I know you interviewed them. Mm-hmm. They have mm-hmm. really, really good um, f- uh, Asian food there. And also the decor is yeah, just Yeah, I amazing. love sending people there because it's yeah. like a good representation yeah, of yeah. Like, Asian food. Yeah, yeah. And like- f- for dim sums, I also like Noodle Village. So um, they're in Chinatown. So I think they have like a good variety of like Cantonese food um yeah and Thai food I love Thai food and Vietnamese too it's just so many I can't <laughs> yeah yeah if you would allow me top four yeah I would say <laughs> definitely Whole Foods the East Village Taiwanese beef noodle soup mm-hmm. so effing good um number two is Pho Bang on Mott Street one of my favorites like more like mom and pop eating these yeah. restaurants mm. it's super classic and you know everyone there speaks Vietnamese um whether they're Vietnamese or not um Madame Barbecue I what Jimmy and Yen are doing it's so innovative Our, their food program their menu it's it's so innovative and creative and it, I feel like it's a really great reflection of Vietnamese influences along with modern American influences and of course D&D similar thing they, they they're one of the restaurants who are brought so many new dishes um, new Vietnamese dishes that have never been showcased before in New York City so I'm a huge fan of all four of those restaurants great picks ladies <laughs> alright thanks for all the answers and for sharing your stories Sarah and Ramu yes. thanks for having yeah, us thanks for having yeah. us yeah, such a pleasure having you both on the air um, and that wraps up our show for tonight thank you dear listeners for tuning in did you like this episode? If so, please leave us a podcast review to let us know your thoughts and what you want to hear more of. We truly appreciate your feedback. And we'll be back in a couple weeks. That's June 19th with another awesome conversation from the world of Asian food. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.